Okay, thanks, Sabina. Um, it's my pleasure to give this talk for this friendly audience, and I hope that you guys are going to indeed stop me if uh, I'm um, taking turns that are unpredictable and hard to follow. So, uh, with that, let's get into it. So. Uh, this talk is about uh, a bunch of results that have been obtained uh, by us and some other people uh, during the last year or, or two years. Uh, and it's, it's done in the context of reinforcement learning. And I'm pretty excited about this results. So I just want to convey some like general view about like, well, where is this field going and what are these exciting results? So the title is Hardness of MDP Planning with Linear Function Approximation. We'll absolutely break this down, so don't worry about it. Uh, but let's start with some, some big questions. We have these beautiful pictures about various successes of uh, RL in, in various domains. And, and we see this, and then one must be wondering about, OK, why, why is this happening? Uh, why is uh, why are these R algorithms successful? What makes them work? When can we expect them to be successful? Um, and uh, maybe we want to we don't want to stop there. Uh, we might be asking the question: Are we missing something uh, else? Like, should we use maybe some other algorithms which could be even more successful, or are we should we be just happy with, uh, with the algorithms uh, that have been proposed so far? Can we broaden the applicability of RL? And related to that, uh, these algorithms are often quite complex. They have many uh, parts. Which of these parts are important for these successes? All right, so, so these are the questions that are in the back of my mind. And I, I usually like to translate these questions to some crisp theoretical questions. So that's, that's what, uh, what is going to go on today. I will try to do this uh, today and then show you how I'm, I'm trying to answer these questions by using tools of theory. Uh, so for this, uh, first we need to talk about what we mean by success. And for success, I... Um, I'm going to postulate there are at least three requirements. One is that uh, we want our tools, algorithms, methods to be flexible, general. And I will be more specific about in, in what way I mean this. Um, but at a very high level, this is what we want, right? Like you want your algorithms to be quite generally applicable without being too concerned. Um, and you also want to have effective algorithms, algorithms that do their job, that they are supposed to do. And you also want to have efficient algorithms. I guess in general, unrelated to reinforcement learning, this is what you want when you are designing algorithms. And so today I'm going to be a little bit more specific than this. This is very general. So I'm going to propose a very specific set of requirements that I like to, uh, to use for thinking about these questions uh, in the context of reinforcement learning and, and in this case planning uh, in the context of today's talk. So regarding flexibility or generality, uh, I'm proposing that uh, this should be viewed as the requirement that um, the algorithms should work in, um, uh, in conjunction with a functional approximation techniques, because this is what makes uh, us hopeful that we can tackle this uh, huge, huge uh, uh, planning problems or reinforcement learning problems. Um, so this, uh, this is a requirement for generator flexibility. For effectiveness, uh, we want the algorithms to be as good as they can get in the face of like whatever functional approximation technique is, is thrown at them. 
and whatever MDP they are put into, right? So if there is a good fit between the MDP and the functional approximation tool, we want the algorithm to take advantage of that. If uh, there was no good fit, there is nothing much that you can do. And maybe you allow a little bit of extra gap in, in terms of the performance uh, compared to the best possible that um, you could achieve. Uh, um, and uh, just just for for allowing uh, a little room um, for for playing around, and um, then efficiency is just going to be the usual thing. It's uh, we want polynomial time algorithms, but uh, we could be more demanding. Uh, we could say that well, I want linear time algorithms or, or whatnot. Like, but I think that this is this is a good start. Everyone can replace. Uh, the efficiency requirement with their own favorite requirements. What's important here is that there are four quantities mentioned in this uh, runtime guarantee. One is the planning horizon. If, if you think about that, you're planning for eight steps uh, in this kind of problems, this would be you know, effective horizon. Um, then that's uh, the, uh, the runtime should not scale very badly with the, uh, with the planning horizon. Similarly, runtime shouldn't scale very badly with the number of actions. If it should scale at all with the number of actions, um, um, but okay, let me um, just allow myself to, to, to include the number of actions for now. And later we can discuss uh, requirements which would do away with that. D, this, this quantity there, that's dimension. Uh, so that's the number of features that you use in your linear function approximator. And one over that is this extra little gap that you allow uh, your algorithms to, uh, to introduce in terms of its effectiveness, of how close it is to the best possible. And you want to, uh, the algorithms to be proportional to the inverse of this gap. So they don't, like they're not too slow. Uh, this is not super fast in terms of like how quickly you can close this suboptimality gap, but it's, it's tolerable, I think. So this is what we want. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk all, uh, all about this in the context of uh, Markov decision processes. And I like to do, uh, I like to use this framework because it's, it's very nice and simple and it uh, captures the key aspects of what makes these problems interesting and relevant for a lot of applications. So what are these key aspects? Uh, so uh, we want to uh, be able to sum objective uh, in a simple way. And in MDPs, you have the reward function and you just want to maximize uh, the total reward over time. So it's a very simple objective. I like that, um, and yet it captures a lot of different things. Um, the second is that MDPs have states, and that means that uh, in planning, you have to uh, plan ahead. Maybe you need to get to a state to uh, get some big rewards. Uh, so multi-step planning is, is a key uh, requirement here. These are the problems we're interested in. The next is that um, we want to have stochastic transitions. By the way, I think that I can use, oh yeah, good, I have a pen. I forgot about it. Um, all right, so everyone kind of know, knows this and uh, here I just put up a, a, a nice little example just to remind uh, ourselves <clears throat> of how MDPs look like. So to me, MDPs are like just the generalization of like navigation problems where you make transitions stochastic and uh, you have maybe cost or rewards uh, induced uh, along the transition. So here in this very uh, little example, toy example, you have three states. Uh, the cool state of a car, so this is like a car racing example taken from a course from Berkeley. Um, and uh, there is another state where the car is warm and then, then there is a third state where the car is uh, overheated or toast. 
And you have for every state two different actions that you can take. You can go slow or you can go fast. And if you're going um, fast, let's say in the, the cool state, then with three quarter of probability, your car is going to stay cool. And with one quarter of probability, the car is going to get warm. So you, you move to a new state as a result of taking an action. And uh, while doing that, you also incur some rewards. In this case, going fast is rewarded for whatever reason. So we got a big reward of 10 uh, if we take uh, the action fast. And this applies to the next state as well and the final state. No, there, that, that doesn't apply. I will come back to that uh, a little bit later. So if you take the slow action, then the next uh, state is just the cool state. Um, it's kind of sensible. If you take the slow action in the warm state, then maybe you stay warm with probably one half and with probably the one half, uh, you might cool down, you get a reward of one. And finally, if you take fast in the warm state, that your car um, may get toasted. It will actually get toasted right away. <laughs> with probably the one, you get a big reward for that. But after your car is toasted, it cannot do anything. Uh, whichever action you take, slow or fast, you don't get any rewards and you stay in a toasted state. So sad end, if you want to maximize uh, reward in this uh, example over time, then clearly you shouldn't be taking the fast action in the warm state. Um, and uh, well, a little bit of thinking, you realize that well, in the cool state, you should always take the fast action in the warm state. You should never take the fast action. And that way you're gonna be happily collecting rewards. And if you sum up all the rewards, like you, you're gonna see that it's infinite. So either you take a finite horizon version of this when you, after eight steps, you're gonna cut um, off the episode, or maybe you're gonna introduce uh, a discount factor that uh, everyone knows the way it works, that like if you incur a reward after T steps, then gamma to the power of T is going to scale down the reward. So the rewards achieved further away in the future versus less. All right, um, so the performance objectives, are does uh, to collect as much reward over time. And um, this induce, uh, the, the performance objective induces this value functions. Uh, I assume that everyone kind of knows this basic stuff about MDPs. Uh, so I, I will go relatively fast, I guess. Uh, already spending quite a bit of time on this, but I just want to make sure that everyone kind of uh, is on the same page. So these value functions for a given policy. So what, what is a policy? So in this case, a very simple policy would be like, whichever state you are in, uh, you have a <clears throat> set way of choosing some actions. Maybe the policy could also use information from the past. It doesn't really matter. And, and in the MDPs, uh, you would have no advantage of doing that anyways. Uh, so anyway, so if you have given a policy, then for every initial state, if you run that policy, you can collect some reward, maybe you some, some the rewards up in a discounted fashion, you can take the expected value of them. That gives the value of the policy of that state, okay? So that if you do this for every possible state here, there were three states, then you get what's called the state value function of the policy. And the uh, optimization or planning problem is to come up with a policy such that this value is the largest possible in every possible state. Miraculously, there exists such a policy. And um, if you actually know the best possible values, which are usually denoted by V star, and then this is called the optimal value function, um, then the optimal value function basically captures everything almost that you want to know. Uh, so if you do what's called a one-step look ahead uh, planning, given this optimal value function, then you can very quickly figure out what policy to, to use. Uh, basically, uh, you, you try every action and um, you see where the actions leads and what uh, reward it incurs. And uh, 
and uh, if it lands in some state, you just assume that from that point on, the process is going to give you the optimal value. And then you calculate the, the index or the value of every action this way. And you take the actions which are maximizing these one step look ahead values. And that is an optimal policy. That gives you an optimal policy. So the summary is that Vistar, knowing Vistar is really great. And you can, um, um, introduce this variation, and it's it's uh, useful to introduce this variation when you assign values to state action pairs, given a state, given an action, you start with that action, and after that you follow the policy um, to get some values, so that's your action value function for the policy, and then similarly, the optimal action values are the ones that uh, any policy can collect in, in the best possible case. And, and the nice thing about the, the action value functions is that in the one step look at calculation, we had to use the structure of the MDP, the transition structure and the rewards here, knowing just the optimal state action value function, it's enough to, uh, to maximize this with respect to the actions and then you'll be optimal. So this, this was just basics. Uh, everyone kind of uh, knows this. Okay, this is great, um, but how are we going to do this? Like, how are we proposing to do these things? Uh, so if we calculated B star or Q star, we would know what to do. And these are signs to every state and action and a real number, but how many states are there in an MDP? So here are the examples uh, from my opening page for this Dexter's RM example. We have a continuous state space and it's roughly 60 dimensional. So it's, uh, it's uncountably many states, right? Like you can't really just like calculate this function and store all the values. Um, in the other examples, things are discrete. Uh, so things are finite, but big finite numbers are not so different from infinite, right? Like for the Atari uh, games, so this, this is the second example. Uh, the number of states is roughly 10 to the 38. The number of goal positions uh, is, is even bigger, 10 to the 172. And the number of uh, positions is Bagamon, uh, which, is, which was uh, the game where first we saw some big successes for, for Ariel and back in the time. Uh, it's a little bit smaller, but it's still quite big, 10 to the 20. So you can't really hope to store that many states in a computer. So you really have to do something else. Um, so it's, it's great to realize that Q star, knowing Q star would be sufficient, but uh, that's kind of not enough. So what really does make these algorithms er er work uh, on these examples? Well, I claim that there are three ingredients at least. Uh, maybe other people have uh, further uh, ideas about uh, this, but uh, I think that these, these are definitely key. Uh, we have simulators uh, and we have large compute and we have large neural networks uh, you know, in all of these examples. And if you think about it a little bit, if you have a simulator and you have large compute, uh, then, then this is what's called planning, right? So, so you're interacting with a simulator and you want to somehow extract a good policy after so much interaction. And, and you want to minimize the total time spent on extracting this uh, piece of information, this, this knowledge of how to act. And uh, for uh, neural networks, uh, so they, they seem to be, uh, quite a recurring theme uh, in successful applications of RL. And yet I'm going to propose that we should stay, take a step back and just study the linear case. So if you want linear function approximation is also neural networks, it's just very simple. The, uh, the non-linearity is just not present. And I say that we should try to understand what makes these algorithms work first in the linear framework and then we can go back to the neural networks and then re-ask the same questions. Uh, neural networks definitely bring in extra complications, but before we sort out the linear case, I don't feel that uh, we really do have much of a chance of sorting out in a reasonable way uh, what makes these algorithms work uh, with neural networks. 
even though I have to uh, add the remark that uh, there's been a lot of work in the 90s and, and around 2000s and so, so forth, where neural networks were also very popular uh, in the context of, of reinforcement learning. So uh, there's been really good work uh, that was aiming at studying neural networks, but I say that that only scratches the surface. So we want to go a little bit deeper than that. And so let's go back to the drawing board. Let's do everything with linear function approximation first. All right. Any questions so far? Is there anything fundamentally different about using games rather than just planning in an environment that isn't trying to beat you? Oh, whether, um, yeah, like the self play aspect, I think I'm not going to uh, attempt to understand whether self play can be a successful strategy to develop good game engines, so to say. Uh, so the, yes, there are. That is something special. They are more. They are expected to be more difficult, if anything, right? Um, so I, I, yeah, they're a little bit different, uh, but at the same time, the algorithms tend to be the same, uh, very similar. Uh, but but I'm not going to make an attempt to understand uh, this. Well, you can think about some of the games. So there are single age. Like we should be a little bit more specific, right? There are single agent games and multi agent games. In single agent games, that's like reinforcement learning. That's like the, nothing tries to beat you, it's just nature. Uh, and that's, that's the realm of MVPs. Multi agent games, it's, it's more complicated. Uh, let's leave that for the future. Okay, good. That's a very good point. Uh, we shouldn't forget about that, that aspect, uh, maybe one day. All right, so. What's the next important ingredient? Uh, it's, it's function approximation. And so why, why do we need function approximation? It's exactly because as we talked about, the state spaces are huge. Like you can't hope to, uh, to do anything without uh, doing some kind of compression. If you want to represent these value functions, you have to have a compressed representation of the value functions. So how does it work? Uh, well, okay. So before value functions, you can think about compressing policies as well. We're not going to do that today. Uh, I think that compressing policies is somehow feels less natural and more challenging. I know about some hard decisions are that right uh, like at the start like makes it really hard to take off. So this grandiose goal that it should work with any function approximation technique is falling apart right at the beginning due to some hardness results if you try to compress policies. Um, if you're not trying to do that, uh, but you try to compress value functions, as I'm going to suggest we should be trying to do, so that's what the algorithms mostly do anyways. Okay, they, they also try to compress the, the policies, but uh, let's focus on the value function part. Um, so then um, the things that you might consider compressing of the optimal value function, uh, the state value function, the value functions of the policies that you see and the state action value functions, same thing, okay? So here the big idea is to somehow, we, we want to do these calculations that uh, need to be done during planning in a compressed form. Um, so how, how does this work? Uh, let's say you have state action value function approximation, and let's say you want to compress uh, the action value function of a policy. Uh, with linear function approximation, the way it works is that you're going to have uh, d basis functions. So I go from one to d. Uh, so this is like, you know, like uh, either polynomial basis functions. And these are just different functions over, over the, well, OK, uh, I made a typo here, over the state action space. Uh, and you take these basis functions, and then you consider all possible linear combinations of them. And if they are rich enough and they generate a quite large space and then you hope that the space that they generate captures uh, the value function's interest, let's say in this case, the, uh, the value function of this policy. And the point here is that you only need D coefficients, uh, this parameter vector theta that has uh, D numbers in it, to represent objects uh, that are over huge spaces, okay? So here in this example, 
maybe you have a continuous state action space and you can represent objects over this enormous spaces, uh, infinite dimensional vectors, if, if you think about it, uh, with just a few coefficients. Okay, so that is compression going on. Um, so it is an example. You have uh, the exact function is this dotted uh, line and uh, you can fit Legendre polynomials to it fully, uh, um, approximations to it or a Taylor approximation and then you see the results here uh, on this figure. Uh, so here you have like certain coefficients and fitting this function. It's pretty amazing. Like it's pretty accurate fit. It's not, not that bad. Um, and here the number of um, inputs, uh, this would be the state action space, it's just infinite, right? It doesn't matter. Of course, this, is, this can't be successful always, uh, but uh, as we said, we only want to be successful when that is a chance to be successful. Right, so back to the criteria. Uh, flexibility, we want the algorithms to accept any feature map. We want efficiency, this poly runtime regardless of the number of states. And we want effectiveness, and that's the next topic to talk about. Uh, so the policy uh, that we obtain uh, from the planner should improve uh, as the fitness, uh, how fit the MDP feature map, uh, um, how fit uh, is, is the spare. Uh, and, and this is what I want to talk about next. How do we measure this fitness? So this fitness can be measured in many different ways. So there is no single answer to that. So let me uh, just do it in the context of state action feature map first. Uh, so introduce this notation of F theta. So this is an abbreviation uh, just for this uh, linear function approximation is parameter uh, theta. And then the, the first way to measure the fitness of an MDPM and uh, some feature, um, function um, phi uh, by, by doing the, like playing this, this game uh, that you choose a policy, then I can choose the parameters such that uh, the action value function of the policy, which is induced by, by the MVP, right? Like that's, that's where the MVP comes in, um, is best fit, okay? And if, if in this playing in this game, I kind of win, uh, meaning that I can keep this number small, this worst case approximation error small, then uh, that just means like that we demand that the algorithm, the planning algorithm should be good. Like the, the, the outcome, the policy that it calculates has to be a good policy. It shouldn't lose a lot compared to this best possible fits. Now, of course, it, it cannot do this fitting like this this fitting may involve infinitely many state action pairs. So there's like, there is non-trivial questions there. Like, can, can you get away with this? Like, like, can you even compete with this? Like, is that even possible? So that's one measure. Uh, the next measure is very similar. It is a little bit simpler. Maybe I should have started with that. Uh, you, um, you take the MDP and we just want to fit to the optimal value function. In it. And if this fit is good, then we demand that the planner returns good policies. Of course, we don't demand anything if this fit is not good, right? So it's like, we just want this generality that like someone else uh, comes up with the feature map and if they are able to do a good job, separation of concerns, modularity, right? Then our algorithm can take advantage of that. Okay, so this is the aspect that, that uh, I'm after, I want to investigate. There are other criteria like, okay, uh, for people who know what the Bauman operator is, you apply the Bauman operator to a function and like how big is the residue? And if the residue is always small, that's kind of like a closeness assumption. And that's, that's, uh, that's also a, a measure. And these measures relate to each other in certain ways. So uh, we can study these questions then. You can do the same uh, with state uh, feature maps. Uh, you can define the same type of quantities and, and indeed people uh, are, are doing this. Uh, this is what classically have been proposed already in the, the 60s uh, by Bamon and co-workers uh, to, do, to use linear function approximation for these compression uh, questions. Um, and now uh, we're getting to uh, 
to the point where we can, I think, meaningfully answer at least uh, some of these questions. Uh, okay, so when to expect these errors to be small? Well, you might be very skeptical that these errors are ever going to be small. Well, one bad news is that if they are not small, then of course, like you can't hope the algorithms to work well. But uh, the not so bad news is that, well, there's a lot of redundancy a lot of times in the way things are encoded, like not all states are important. So in this case, you have this visual mountain cut and there are these two flowers and then they're blinking and changing and it doesn't matter for the physics, right? So it's redundant, like you can factor it out, like from the point of view of value functions, the state of the flowers just doesn't matter, right? Um, and uh, I don't want to go into this uh, too much. Yeah. I just had a quick question about those measures of error. I was wondering, um, is it sort of contextually dependent uh, as to which measure you would like to use generally or? No, I think that we have to understand the relationship between the measures. And uh, we should work with the weakest possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, if uh, that is not possible, like it's not possible to come up with reasonable solutions with the weakest possible measures, then we have to consider the alternatives. That, that's how I view this. So this is more like a menu of things. Right, OK. Thanks. Um, so the only principle is that, okay, like if, if one dominates the other is like it's weaker than sure, like let's start with that. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So features capture redundancy. So if you, for example, have a big state space, but you can group states together and all the states act similarly with regard to rewards and transitions uh, concerning group identity of target states, then you have a way of compressing the MVP uh, so you can create this partitioning and then you can create a feature map that just indicates uh, which partition a state belongs to. And with that, if there are not too many partitions, you can have as many states as you wish. You compress the MDP. In this case, all these measures are going to be small because there is nice closeness properties. So all the value functions live in a feature spacing used by the features and, and, and everything is really nice. Okay. So we know of nice cases and, and we hope that in the applications, people design the feature maps in a clever way such that uh, these error metrics are not too bad. And then the question is, can we design algorithms that take advantage of this? Um, to talk about this, we should also clarify what we meant by the planner's efficiency. So to finally come to uh, like some formal, more formal definitions. And so in terms of efficiency, uh, what, I, what we are looking at here is that you have a planner and then you have a simulator and the simulator not only gives you, uh, we will see what it gives you, but it, it will also tell you features. So the planner starts with uh, being told that you should come up with a good action and an action that, that is somehow good at this initial state as not. And it's also given uh, the features, let's say you have state uh, value features. So it also given the features of this state. And then a planner can go and consult this uh, simulator. So the simulator is treated as a black box. The big advantage to that is that the planner doesn't need uh, extensive description, extensive form description of the MVP, which would take just too much space, right? Like you, if the number of state action pairs is infinite, like you can't have that, right? But you can access a simulator, you send uh, a state action pair to a simulator, and, and this should be a state usually of that you have encountered in previous course. Um, and then you will get back an X state, the reward, and maybe the feature of the, uh, not maybe, but definitely the feature of uh, the next state. And you go on, okay? So you get all this uh, information, um, so then the planner can, can repeat this process until it decides that, well, I have enough information, I did all my calculations, and now I can output an action. And so then, then it outputs the action. And so in terms of efficiency, what matters here is how much time you, you plan in, uh, you, you spend in this planning loop. Okay, so that's the compute time. Sometimes we calculate only the number of queries submitted, 
sometimes it's obvious from the planner that, okay, like if the number of credits is small, then the compute time is small. Sometimes that's not so obvious. Sometimes we calculate the credits because we know that it's a lower bond on compute time. And we want to prove something that like no planner can get away without that many, uh, that much compute time. Then we just do that with uh, query time bounds. Okay, so in terms of the, the last ingredient, which is like how effective is the planner? Um, so the effectiveness is going to be defined in terms of the policy that is induced if the planner is put into closed loop interconnection with the simulated word. So you have the same simulated word uh, as here. And then now uh, this word actually makes the transitions uh, according to the same transition properties that are used here in the simulator. And so in this closed loop uh, usage, uh, you can see that the planner is going to induce some way of acting, uh, which induces values. And so you can evaluate like how much value a planner is going to collect if it's used in this closed loop fashion. And the planner is going to be more effective if it collects more value. It's kind of the obvious uh, way to, to think about this. Well, what this sweeps under the rug is that maybe the real environment is not like the simulated environment. Well, in the case, in the examples that we talked about, it is kind of, um, but sometimes there could be discrepancies, but I'm not going to talk about this. Uh, I, I don't think that the big discrepancy is a big deal. So people call this seem to real. I, I don't think that it's such a big deal. Um, um, I, I think that it's, it's worthwhile to, to study this, uh, this question on its own in its, uh, in its most crystallized form first and then bring in this uh, um, discrepancy uh, between the simulated and the real world. Um, okay, and, and, and to a degree, we understand it quite well when, uh, when uh, this discrepancy doesn't matter. Okay, so, uh, Coming to results, uh, everyone's uh, so eager to, to see some results after this length introduction uh, of the framework. Uh, so this, uh, the first result I want to talk about uh, starts with us asking the question, what would happen if in uniform error, I, uh, I, I was given some features such that uh, the features approximate all action value functions up to an accuracy epsilon. So epsilon is, is one of the quantities. And the other quantity is data. And I demand that uh, the policy that the planner calculates is data suboptimal compared to optimal, okay? Uh, so if epsilon is small, then we expect that, oh, we should be able to keep up with the epsilon. We should be able to, to get a better, um, induced policy from an efficient planner. And the question is, can we uh, get this? And interestingly, the answer is going to depend on whether this desired suboptimality is smaller or bigger than square root D times epsilon. So there is this magical square root D appearing there, which inflates the approximation error of epsilon. And uh, if, the accuracy, the de de demanded accuracy or suboptimality level of the planner is smaller than square root d epsilon, this threshold, then uh, there is a recent paper, and, and I would say that this was a breakthrough realization, uh, that uh, in this case, this, this high accuracy planning is just not going to fly at all. Like you, every planner has to suffer an inflation of the approximation error of square root of D if the planner wants to call itself efficient. So if the planner cannot afford exponential runtimes in either the dimension or the planning horizon, the smallest of the two. So there's, there's D uh, wedge H, that's just the minimum between D and H. Uh, to make it fit uh, the slide better. Uh, so if the planner wants to avoid this exponential cost and it wants to say that, well, I can deal with any feature map. Okay, so we want flexibility, we want efficiency, 
and effectiveness, you can't have it in this case. And notice that here, this requirement was really optimistic that for every policy that you encounter ever in the MVP, you have good approximation errors. So the action value functions are well compressible. Well, they could be very compressible, but if you're demanding too much from the planner, you won't have it. And the construction is, is based on, uh, I won't go into the details of that, but it's based on high dimensional geometric arguments uh, that in D dimensional space, you can have two to the D vectors, which are near orthogonal to each other. So it's like, you might think based on your 3D geometry view that like the orthogonal vectors, the number of those is D or is going to be low. But if you allow, you know, like some positive inner product, like one force, an inner product of one force between the vectors, then on the sphere, you can place two to the D of these vectors and, uh, and they, they nicely fit. So the inner product between any pair of them is not going to be uh, any disjoint pair of them, is not going to be bigger than one force. That means that they're nearly orthogonal. If you try one, you won't get much information about the other. And these are the feature vectors. So that kind of means that in this high dimensional space, there's this regime uh, where uh, like it, it just blocks you. Like you, you can't get too accurate information too quickly. Uh, and this relates to extrapolation. This relates to that in reinforcement learning, you need to reason about the actions that you can uh, choose you need to reason about the, uh, the states that you haven't visited, and that's, that's extrapolation. And the extrapolation error in linear function approximation in a worst case sense has to be inflated with square root D uh, when, when it comes to the uniform norm. And the uniform norm is, is crucial here, but you can't get away without it. Like it's not a deficit of the analysis, it's just like, if we want these three things to demand them, you can't have it, right? So that that's that's that was, I think, uh, to a lot of people, uh, quite shocking news uh, in the field. So this goes back to to this result by uh, Simon Du, Sham Kekade, Lucien Wang, and Lin Yang. It was published by Clear this year. Um, now, on the other hand, if you do not demand this really high accuracy, uh, so the data, the suboptimality gap could be, you know, like in proportion to square root of D times epsilon, this approximation error. Then the good news is that algorithms like approximate policy iteration that we all know and love, and DQN is basically doing the same thing, uh, are going to guarantee to work, except some small things. So since you need to control the extrapolation errors, you can't just like, like blindly like make up at what state action pairs like you want to uh, include in your training data and whatnot. You have to be careful about that. I, I don't really have time to go into that, but that's, that's an important lesson. Again, that extrapolation error needs to be carefully controlled and you, you need to consider this. There is no way around it. All right, so the next case is, um, is going to be then uh, the optimal action value function. Uh, so that seems to be like a more relaxed condition is, is close to uh, your function space. And of course, if you only demand this um, and you demand at the same time high accuracy planning, then things are not going to work for the same reason as in the previous case. So you have a blow up affair, you can't have that. Um, and uh, if that is not the case, then you're going to have another fork. You can ask like, oh, am I going to have many actions? And if uh, you don't have many actions, then we don't know the answer to this question. And if you have many actions, then, then you, you are hoping that, okay, maybe I also have some optimization or occur that can solve this argmax problem of, uh, you know, like you have this function approximator uh, approximating action value functions, you, you have your favorite theta, 
you'll plug it in and then you might have many actions, but maybe this optimization problem can be efficiently solved. So even if that is the case, you can have many actions and maybe in that case, you can get away with, with a good algorithm. So uh, does there exist a planner uh, that satisfies all these requirements? And uh, the answer is, um, Again, uh, a big no. So this uh, this is a, a result by uh, Galliard and uh, Phil, uh, with whom I was working over the summer on this problem. It just made it too odd. And, and this result tells you that, well, it's very similar to the previous case. Uh, so you just can't have it, right? Um, so if you have many actions, then that's that's an obstacle, regardless of whether this optimization problem can be efficiently solved. It's just the number of queries that you need to submit uh, is going to be exponential in the, the smallest of the dimension and uh, the horizon. So I don't really have time, too much time to uh, introduce this construction. The paper is online. Everyone can take a look at it. Uh, it's getting in better and better shape uh, every day. I think we are just going to resubmit a new version to archive uh, in a couple of days uh, of this. But, but the main idea was to start from the construction of the Simon Du et al. paper uh, using the Johnson Linden Strauss Lemma uh, to give the features. And we want some parameter, some. Uh, some action out of exponents. So we, we decided to choose exponentially many actions. So that, that was the key. Uh, so we're packing the sphere with all these actions in a way. And one action is optimal in every state. And then the construction goes that like, there are no, uh, then you build a big tree and it's a deterministic process, except that at the bottom, there are some random rewards and uh, you have to do some kind of scaling uh, with the depths of um, the feature vectors uh, to count for, uh, so that the learner cannot, or the, the planner cannot uh, figure out which is the optimal action. So the difficulty is going to come from that. You have too many actions. And so if the planner wants to figure out what is the optimal action here, uh, the construction will be such that it really needs to try everything. Like it cannot get away. Like information is not leaked anywhere all the rewards along the whole process is zero. In the bottom, you have this uh, really small parameter, Bernoulli rewards, like two to the minus D parameters, uh, small rewards. And there is no other information. So it's like, you can make everything work. Uh, the Bamon equations hold. So you have Q star reliability. Q star in this case lies in the feature space, spend up in the part of the features. Um, and uh, or function space spent by the features. And yet uh, uh, there, is, uh, there is no information that, that you can make use of, right? So in this case, we see that if you have many actions, having strong features, again, is not sufficient. And it's not a fault of us that we were not able to come up, come up with algorithms that would solve this case. No one will ever be able to do that, right? Okay. Uh, so, the, the last case I wanted to talk about is, is somewhat related to the previous one. So here uh, we care about when uh, the optimal value function lies in the, the function space or, or close to the function space. And of course, if this approximation error is large, then everything is bad. If it's not, then we can again ask the same question. Uh, do we have many actions? If yes, then things are again bad. If you don't have, uh, so why, why are things bad in that case? In that case, you have to do the one step look ahead. And so the one step look ahead is just going to cost you too much. Uh, so you can't have too many actions. If you don't have too many actions, uh, then you can ask this question, do we have many courses? So what, what are these core states? So the feature vectors uh, live in this RD space. And uh, so these dots represent all possible feature vectors under all states. And um, if you have uh, the convex hull of uh, the feature vectors is such that you have only a few vertices uh, that are spanning this convex hull. Uh, so let's call the number of them of, of that is M. And it's acceptable that your algorithm runs in polynomial time in M 
And we have a result with uh, Russian that was published at, at NeurIPS uh, with the coarse stump ergotum uh, that gives you a polynomial time ergotum for this case. So at least in that case, you can get away again with uh, poly time result. You can somehow relax this requirement a little bit, but maybe not, not too much because um, what happens when there are not many core states? Uh, uh, so if, when, when there, is, there are many core states, uh, so then uh, there are two cases, either you care about the runtime cost or you, you care about the query cost. If you care about the runtime cost, we have no answer. Um, if you care about the query cost, then we do have a, a positive answer. Um, well, it's, uh, all right. It's a little bit different. Uh, so we have an ergotum whose runtime is not quite what you expect to, to, uh, to see. Uh, so it's not polynomial in DAH and one over data, but it's polynomial in T to the part of A. So if you have two actions, then it's D squared. If you have three actions, it's D cubed, but it grows really fast uh, with A. We don't know whether that's necessary or not, but, but this is the best that we could uh, got so far. And so this uh, is, is a new paper that's our archive. Uh, we, we call the ergotum the tensor plan ergotum. And uh, just in a nutshell, this, this is a, an ergotum that works uh, quite differently than your usual DP ergotums. Uh, it's an ergotum that kind of works with uh, uh, just keeping a, a hypothesis uh, set about the feasible parameter vectors that could parameterize B star. And uh, then it solves for an optimistic value uh, for that given the initial state. And um, once it has this, uh, it's going to test whether uh, this parameter was indeed a, a good choice. And uh, so it's, it's kind of like a generate and test ergotum. So I can't go into the details, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, there is some nice math to it. You can tensorize everything, and that's how you 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 end up with this t to the power of a uh, linear equations. The nice thing here is that we don't use the max. Like uh, instead of using the max, uh, we kind of reformulate things in an algebraic uh, way. We we introduce some products, and, then, and we can tensorize that. And everything becomes linear again after we do these tricks. All right. Um, so my time's up. Um, there are many questions. Would ADP algorithms, for example, work in the same case? And and the answer there is, I'm guessing not, but I don't know. Um, is this ergotum going to be sensitive to errors just as much as all the other ergotums? Uh, is it sensitive to reliability just as much as all the others? Uh, does it extend to Q star reliability with few actions? We don't know. Uh, that, that's also an open question. All right, so the key idea today was that computation is important. It should be done in a compressed form. And uh, to explain why we see ergotum succeed, we should be able to explain why computation in a compressed form uh, succeeds. And, and when does that happen? For this, I propose three criteria. I studied this in the context of linear function approximation. And there are lots of lessons that uh, I've learned personally. Uh, so in control extrapolation errors probably matter. You really have to worry about that. The square root of d blew up in the worst case is unavoidable of the approximation errors. Least squares may be okay, but you have to control for extrapolation errors that requires being careful of how you collect your data. Um, and uh, there are alternatives to ADP like this generate and test algorithm that I was talking about it. Uh, and, and it's not using bootstrapping in the same way. It's still using the Bauman equations, but it's doing something, uh, things a little bit differently. And uh, it also uses optimism. And already planning, in planning, we see that optimism is, is quite important. Uh, so one big takeaway from uh, all this is uh, what I, I started to suspect is it's the case that uh, well, the original dream, dream is that you're going to have this modular thing that like I threw a function, I, I threw a feature map at the planner 
and it just works. Um, and then that seems that uh, that may not be the case. So maybe uh, maybe the algorithms need to be tailored. Like you can't just like throw an ADP algorithm with any function approximator uh, with it. Like the algorithm may need to understand things about the function approximators. Maybe some closer uh, uh, coupling between the function approximator choice and the planet design is necessary. There is this modularity may not. Uh, work as well as we hoped uh, it's going to work. Uh, there are lots of uh, parallel developments in batch and online learning. Of course, batch is hard, but online is easier. Uh, seem to real, I briefly touched it, unobserved states like that's completely out of the realm for this framework, except that the feature vectors kind of like allow you to talk about state aliasing, but this compressibility, uh, it's, it's kind of like a nice intermediate ground. If, if you are all, only able to compress the optimal value function and not the value function of all the policies or the dynamics of the MDP, then that means that you really did have some sort of latency. Uh, but it's, it's maybe not the same thing. So that, that's why it's, it's a nice uh, intermediate ground. So, okay, so that's, that's it. <laughs> Sorry for going a little bit over time. Um, if people had to leave, that that's fine. I can stay a little bit more, and um, but but I, I do understand if people have to leave, that's fine. I'm happy to take questions. Okay, if nobody has, <clears throat> excuse me, any, oh, we have a question here <laughs> in the chat. Well, at the moment I'm working on a course, you know, <laughs> so I, I'm too busy with, with the course. Uh, after the course, I, I hope to return to these questions and uh, focus on them a little bit more. I mean, like there are little things that uh, we are tying up uh, related to tensor plan, uh, like little observations, uh, but uh, not, nothing really major. Any other questions? Um, so suppose all of these questions are answered. So what happens next? Uh, like we, we, like you, you picked several different choices, like focusing on value functions, etc. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it, it makes a lot of sense uh, to to ask this question. Uh, I think that, okay, so first of all, in the process, uh, as I said, I already learned quite a bit about uh, how to design these algorithms and how to think about these algorithm designs. So that's great, like, okay, like just take that. And after that, if all these questions are answered, I think that it's time to go back to the neural networks, nonlinear case, and then try to answer questions related to that. And obviously, there are the related questions in the context of batch learning and online learning that other people are already trying to answer. But uh, the number of questions, the, the open questions in this field is just so enormous at the moment that uh, I don't think that we're going to run out of questions anytime soon. <laughs> There is no real danger that we have left off. I mean, partial observability, obviously, like, how do you, like, do you, like, what's the, what's the equivalent of this framework that I presented today for partial observability that leaves some hope? Uh, because we know that, like, okay, in the worst case, everything is hopelessly hard, but, like, so what I like about this framework is that uh, it gives you something, and then it, it leaves you some hope that, you can address a big uh, computational questions uh, with tools uh, that you can develop. Uh, and uh, it, it lets you chip away a little bit about this 
huge space of problems which are impossible to do anything about. And the question is the, the same fascinating question for partial observability, right? Like, how, how do you deal with that? I really have no idea. I guess like there are some, some works going into the direction already, but uh, that's, that's way, uh, way more open than even the rest. Uh, do you have any intuition about like moving into asking the same questions, but with regards to nonlinear function approximation neural networks, whether it'll be fundamentally different in a lot of ways, or a lot of it will be some, somewhat similar? Or... Yeah, I mean, like the analysis that has been done in the past uh, was basically a modular analysis where you uh, somehow decouple completely the properties of the function approximator and, and the uh, underlying planning or uh, learning algorithm. Uh, that's an error algorithm. Uh, and, and the big question is whether that's tenable or you are losing something when you're doing that. And uh, at the moment, uh, I'm thinking that maybe you are losing something if you just keep doing this. Uh, I, I didn't believe in this before. So in the past, when people asked ask me that this modular analysis is, uh, is, uh, is a reasonable approach, uh, I always said that it was. Uh, and now I'm not that certain anymore. Uh, so that will be very interesting to figure out. Um, and then uh, we, we already see that, like the, this coupling is much stronger than what we want it to be uh, between the uh, planning algorithm and the function approximator. Uh, and so what does that mean in the context of neural networks? Uh, I really don't know. Um, the other difficulty, of course, uh, when it comes to neural networks is that the theory uh, that exists for them uh, still leaves uh, too many uh, too many open problems. Uh, there are more questions to to ask than they are answered. Uh, the theory mostly almost linearizes uh, the neural networks, which is interesting, right? But at the same time, maybe that's not the realm where uh, but these algorithms actually work. And then the question is, okay, can you, can you develop theoretical tools that are able to approach that? And that's an interesting question on its own. And that's also why I'm not so eager to, to jump on this question of combining RL and neural networks and everything, because well, we don't understand RL, we don't understand neural networks. Like, what good can come out of trying to combine the two? Well, I mean, we tried in the past and, and, and there is this like very high level modular analysis that you can do. Uh, going beyond that, I think that it requires uh, serious innovation. But it's gonna be fun. Does anyone have any other questions? I guess that's it. I think so. Okay, okay. well, thank you very much, Chaba. But thanks everyone for coming. We're happy to have you. So anytime. Yeah, uh, if people have questions anytime, I'm around, right? Like Slack whatever but I'm going to put the slides online if anyone cares. Sure, thank you. <laughs>